Thank you so much, Andrew. Okay, I'm the last thing between you and lunch. Let's get right to work. By the way, it's not California. It's the People's Republic of California. Um, we have here the four key Palestinian leaders over the last century. And as we heard this morning, Abu Mazen Mahmoud Abbas uh, has been really working very hard to weaponize the law in the conflict with Israel to portray the Palestinians as victims of Israeli injustice and to invoke a legal narrative, a legal frame in the conflict. But this actually began a century ago with the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, Haj Amin al Husseini, himself uh, a uh, trained lawyer, he studied law in Cairo, uh, continuing through Ahmed Shukeri, the founder of the PLO, and his successor, Yasser Arafat. Each of them, each of them sought to, along with terrorism, of course, to use the law as a weapon in the conflict against Zionism and against the state of Israel. But how strong is the Palestinian legal case? And what I'm gonna to present to you over the next few minutes is my sort of view that the Palestinian legal case, in contrast to the very strong Kurdish case for self-determination that we just heard, the Palestinian legal case is actually quite weak on the law. On the law, it's a weak case. Why? Because of their repeated renunciations and implied and expressed waivers of statehood. Every offer made to them in the 20th century and beyond, even in the 21st century, has been rejected. And those rejections and renunciations have legal consequence. Well, first of all, are the Palestinians the victims of injustice? As you just heard from Matthias, no. The League of Nations, beginning at the San Remo Accords and then continuing through uh, July of 1922, when the mandate was uh, unanimously, unanimously approved by the League Council, recognized, as we heard, and I just want to emphasize this word reconstituting here that Matthias mentioned, Chaim Weizmann tried really hard to convince the British government in the Balfour Declaration, not to say His Majesty's government view would favor the establishment in Palestine. Weizmann wanted the word re-establishment to convey the notion that we were not coming as colonizers, we were going home. We were returning to that which was originally ours. And finally, five years later, Weizmann succeeded by persuading the League Council to use this word reconstituting, not constituting, not colonizing, not coming to a place where we didn't belong, but as Andrew said, returning home. And so I'm gonna skip through uh, the provisions that Matthias mentioned, and just to show you my summary of the, of the respective rights that were granted by the mandate to, as Matthias said, the beneficiaries of the political side of the mandate, the Jewish people, the right to a national home, the right to political representation, immigration, close settlement of the land, and so forth. But I would call as my first witness in this case, none other than the Mufti himself, who testified before the Shaw Commission in December of 1929 as follows, and I quote, the Palestine mandate does not refer to the protection of the political rights of the Arabs, but refers only to the political rights of the Jews. Thank you very much, Mr. Mufti, you just made my case. Uh, as we heard from Matthias, Palestine was partitioned. It was partitioned in 1923, when the original mandatory borders were severed, partitioned along the length of the Jordan River, the eastern portion, Transjordan, became the Emirate of Transjordan and eventually the state of Jordan, the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan, and Cisjordan, the western side, remained as the mandatory area. So is there an injustice perpetrated by the League of Nations? I would argue absolutely not. That brings me to the Palestine Royal Commission report, July of 1937, when His Majesty's government's highest possible representatives, a royal commission, recommended the original version of the two-state solution. The orange for the Jews, the purple for the Arabs, Britain to retain the salient in green, connecting Jaffa to Jerusalem and Bethlehem. This was proposed on the spot to Chaim Weizmann in January 1937 in his secret testimony before the Royal Commission. The commissioners themselves, in their internal notes to each other, 
came up with a code word for this, which they called the clean cut. And when Weizmann was asked, would you favor an arrangement of this nature, Weizmann didn't say yes, he didn't say no, he said, let me think about it. He confided later in a letter to Albert Einstein, I was stunned, I was stunned. The Zionist Congress considered this proposal and authorized Weizmann to negotiate. Better to have a state than nothing at all, especially in 1937 when Weizmann predicted in his testimony to the commission that Hitler was going to move on the Jews of Europe. The Jews accepted in principle this plan. The Mufti absolutely rejected it and said no. A couple years later, 17 May 1939, the infamous, the infamous McDonald White Paper condemning millions of Jews in Europe to the fate of the Holocaust, closing the doors of Palestine to the Jews, capping Jewish immigration to Palestine at, at an average of 15,000 per year, 75,000 over five years. By, by the way, by the time World War II ended, the 75,000 quota had not even been met. Uh, and the reason for that quota was to lock in a two to one Arab majority because less remembered about the white paper was the provision that said within 10 years, Palestine will become an independent country under what? Majority rule. This was the original version of the one state solution to use former President Trump's phrase, the deal of the 20th century, whereby Palestine would have become a single Arab ruled country. The Mufti said no. He rejected this, why? Because he did not want a single additional Jew allowed into the country. 75,000 was 75,000 too many. And he didn't want to wait 10 years. He wanted statehood immediately. After the war, a joint US-British committee uh, unanimously decided that that white paper was unlawful, called upon the British government to allow 100,000 Jewish displaced persons to come to Palestine, but argued that Palestine ought to continue uh, under either American or British trusteeship. Well, not long after, early 1947, the British government had had enough of Palestine. The British government, of course, still in control of India at that time with a very restive Muslim population, more than all the Arab states combined. Britain, depleted from the war, handed the Palestine file to the UN. The UN in 1947 conducted not one, but two trials to determine the future of Palestine, first under the UN Special Committee uh, for Palestine, UNSCOP, and then following on the UN Ad Hoc Committee for Palestine, both of which arrived at majority verdicts after conducting trials, witnesses, testimony, cross-examination, and so forth, reiterating, going back to the original Peel Commission idea, different borders, but the idea of a two-state solution, Jerusalem would be a separate body, a corpus separatum under international control. Who said yes? The Jews. Who said no? Not surprisingly, the Mufti. And so in Lake Success, New York, 29 November 1947, as Hillel told us this morning, the UN General Assembly approved the two-state solution, but this time with more land for the Jews than had been promised by the British government 10 years earlier the orange for the Jews, the yellow for the Arabs, and again, Jerusalem there in the white, a separate body under international control. New York Times telling us the next day that the General Assembly uh, approved the two-state solution by the requisite two-thirds majority. And then down here you see reference to a commission being appointed to go to Palestine to study how to implement the two-state solution. And a couple of months later in February, this commission reported back to the Security Council in language that we would never in a million years see from anybody in the United Nations today. Look what the Palestine Commission said in February of 1948. Powerful Arab interests, both inside and outside Palestine, are defying the resolution of the General Assembly and are engaged in a deliberate effort to alter by force the settlement envisaged therein. Can you imagine the UN using language like that today, impossible. Well, we've already seen this photograph of Ben-Gurion at the former Tel Aviv Museum of Art, now Independence Hall on Rothschild Boulevard, reading the Declaration of Independence, 14 May 1948. At the same time, the British government announced the termination of the Palestine mandate, leaving Palestine for the last time. The next day, the New York Times reported that 
a new state of Israel was proclaimed. President Truman recognized it provisionally 10 minutes later. And how did Egypt respond? By bombing Tel Aviv. Um, a year later, May 11, 1949, the United Nations completed the pledge to the Jewish people that began with the Balfour Declaration, that was continued with the League of Nations mandate. The UN completed those promises to the Jewish people by voting to admit Israel as a member state of the United Nations, extremely important. And so here, I'm showing you the various uh, proposals that the Arabs rejected. They rejected the original two-state solution in 1937. They rejected the UN's two-state solution in November of 1947. Instead, they launched war. And the outcome of that war, launched by the Palestinian Arabs and by all the surrounding Arab countries against the new state of Israel, the outcome of that war was that these areas in pink here, which had been promised by the UN as part of the uh, Arab state in yellow, those areas fell to Israeli hands during the 1948-1949 war. The armistice agreements that were negotiated in uh, January with Egypt and April of 1949 uh, with Jordan left those captured areas that had been promised to the Arabs in the hands of the new state of Israel. And here is the map uh, of uh, the modern state of Israel as we see today. And so what are the legal consequences of all of this history that I've rushed through quite quickly? Well, uh, first of all, I think it's, and I'm gonna skip this page, very important to note that the Palestinian Arabs rejected these repeated offers of statehood over and over and over again in the 1930s and 1940s. And in my view, as a legal matter, those rejections constitute implicit implicit waivers of statehood and sovereignty. But the Palestinians went further. They made those implicit waivers explicit, not once, but twice. First, in December of 1948, 3,000 Palestinian leaders, tribal leaders, civil society leaders, lawyers, judges, academics, business people, gathered in Jericho and passed a series of resolutions. I was just last week in the British National Archives reading the real-time reporting from the British Embassy in Amman and from the British Embassy in Tel Aviv to London about the Jericho Conference. The Palestinians pledged their loyalty to King Abdullah and they expressly requested that the king annex the West Bank and make the West Bank part of the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan or then the Kingdom of Jordan. Uh, the king said, yes, I will do what you want and the next year annexed the West Bank and that was when Jordan changed its name to the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan. Between 1948 and 1967, not once, not once did the United Nations demand statehood for the Palestinians. Not once did the Palestinians themselves demand statehood in the West Bank or Gaza. And if you don't believe me, look at the original PLO charter from May of 1964. The original charter in Article 24, and I quote, the PLO, does not exercise any regional sovereignty over the West Bank in the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan or the Gaza Strip. Those are their words, not mine. And if you don't believe me, let's take a look. This is one of thousands of documents that I found in the British National Archives from February 26, 1964. The British Embassy in Amman, the ambassador, sending a confidential note to the Foreign Office in London. Ahmed Shukeri has been here in Amman since February 19 on his Palestine entity mission. His first statement on arriving in Amman was that there was no question of creating a Palestine Republic as that would be meaningless, nor was there any intention of attempting to establish a form of Palestinian territorial sovereignty. Um, and it goes on from there to describe the fact that he added that the creation of a Palestine government was not desirable as it would not serve the Palestinian cause. Why? Because the Palestine, that the PLO, which he founded in May of that year, the Palestine, which the PLO wanted to liberate, was not the West Bank. It was not the Gaza Strip. It was the state of Israel. Finally, the PLO agreed at Oslo both in the Declaration of Principles in 1993 and the Interim uh, Agreement in 1995, which we call Oslo II, 
that Israel, the state of Israel, and Arafat's signature is on the document, the state of Israel preserves all of its claims to the West Bank, Jerusalem, and Gaza pending permanent status or final status negotiations. So I'll wrap up. My view is that the Palestinian case on the law is weak. What the Palestinians should be doing is coming back to the negotiation table. We need statecraft and diplomacy to work our way out of this conflict, not litigation. And so what we're seeing at the ICJ, what we're seeing at the ICC is a distraction. It's a distraction. It is going to perpetuate the conflict, not resolve the conflict. Thank you for your invitation, Andrew.